Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to, the, to this lecture across the planet, um, the past and the future of libraries, with Christina Donnelly from Oxford University and Carolina Gris from Factum Foundation. I'm Irene Digolin, and I work for Fondazione Giorgio Cini at the Archive Center, born in 2018. Archive stands for uh, analysis and recording of cultural heritage in Venice. And every year we organize um, Archive Online Academy, a public training program uh, inaugurated in 2020 uh, that includes talks, courses, workshops, and dedicated to digital preservation and enhancement of culture, cultural heritage and digital humanities in general. I would like to uh, remind everyone that your questions are very welcome and you can type them in the chat or uh, you can raise your hand uh, to talk. After Adam Lowe's closing remarks, there will be space for questions and answers. Uh, as usual, the lesson will be published uh, later this month on Fondazione Giorgiocini YouTube channel. And um, I remember you can also follow us on Instagram at the uh, Centro Archive to have um, all the latest updates on new projects and activities uh, of uh, the Archive Center. And um, now uh, uh, I just uh, want to leave the floor to Elena Maschietto. Uh, librarian at the Fondazione Giorgio Cini and uh, also part of the archive team that will introduce the speakers. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the lecture. Okay, thanks, uh, Irene. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm particularly happy to present this first uh, meeting of uh, the Archive Online Academy, which opens uh, this year with a presentation uh, on a topic that is very close and very dear to me as well as many of, uh, of you in the audience, uh, I think. Today we will hear about books and libraries. Um, so I'm glad to introduce Cristina Dondi and Carolina Gris, uh, who will present their research and projects, which uh, despite the, um, their specific and different methods, certainly have a common goal, the virtual reconstruction of a book collection. In the first case, is a, a study of uh, the first uh, of the first first books printed on with movable type on the 15th century and in the second case a collection of medieval arabic manuscripts about falconry so uh, Cristina Dondi is professor of early european book heritage and oxford senior research fellow in the humanities at lincoln college university of oxford and she is also Secretary of uh, CERN Consortium of European Research uh, Libraries. In 2009, she created the international database Material Evidence in Incunabula, May, which is uh, constantly updated, even in this very moment, with information about owners, about the use, the movement of uh, the Incunabula during the centuries. Among uh, the numerous papers she has written, on this occasion I would like to mention uh, the proceedings that she edited as a result of the conference, uh, the big conference that uh, was held here in Venice, uh, Print Revolution and Society in 1450-15. 50 years that changed Europe, uh, that was published in 2020 in open access by the Edizioni Caposcari. Today she will talk about her most uh, recent uh, research, recent but uh, uh, which started to, to take root a long time ago, I, I try to, to, to know, uh, on the library of the ex-monastery of San Giorgio Maggiore, the island of San Giorgio Maggiore, which uh, for those of you who are not familiar with us, is a wonderful place that now houses the Fondazione Giorgio Cini in Venice. Carolina Gris started working with uh, Factum in 2021 as a project manager and a scanner technician. She is mainly based in our archive office on the island of San Giorgio, but often travels uh, to carry out the digitization of paintings and objects and works of art across Europe. 
Today, she will tell us about the Middle East Falconry Archive, MEFA, a major factum project that uh, she has overseen for the last two years. The goal of this project, dedicated to the preservation of Falconry heritage, is to make digital reproduction of manuscripts and their metadata accessible in a digital uh, library. Thanks to MEFA, we can now look at, uh, browse, and compare 56 medieval manuscripts held uh, in uh, different libraries in Europe, United States, Africa, and Middle East. Uh, and now uh, we can see these 56 manuscripts on a single digital platform. And who knows, probably this collection, like the whole project, will grow further. Adam Lowe, the founder of Factum Foundation, will close this session uh, with his remarks on the future of libraries. Um, Factum Foundation, together with uh, the Fondazione Cini and the Digital Lab of the Polytechnic of Lausanne, are deeply involved in the activities of archive, which uh, are generously supported by the Helen Hamlin Trust. So, I will leave the floor to Christina, but I would like to underline from this brief introduction how for both of these projects and for all the best projects, library catalog, access to documents also in a digital format and collaboration among cultural institutions and universities are crucial. Putting the efforts together and the results together, possibly in a digital format that allows dialogue between the different systems Mm, and by enabling the use of metadata, we are working for the preservation, the documentation, the study, the discovery, the dissemination of uh, the huge uh, bibliographical heritage. Um, as uh, we will probably hear from their voices, uh, the skills of historian, paleographer, librarian, archivist, restorer, along with those of photographer, data architect, computer developer, web designer, data analyst, are all involved and all necessary. And today's presentation are an example of this, a sort of an example of a project in the, uh, on digital humanities. So please, Cristina, uh, thanks for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you, Elenia. It's a pleasure to join this uh, workshop today. I will uh, start uh, straight away by sharing my screen. Is it all clear? Yes? Yes, we can see. Wonderful. I'll start. So most of the libraries with Incunabula and indeed with special collections today were created in the 19th century, uh, but their collections are much older and they belong and they are shards of older collections uh, which were um, dispersed over time for various reasons familiar, economical, uh, religious, but most of all, as you will hear today, political reasons. From the 16th century to the 19th century, secularization of mostly monastic institutions took uh, uh, place all over Europe, beginning with uh, those of Henry VIII, in 16th century England, to those of Joseph II in the um, Germanic area, to those of Napoleon, which had an enormous impact uh, uh, on Italy, as well as elsewhere, France and Germany and Spain, to also the secularizations which followed the formation of uh, national states in the modern period. For example, those of uh, Mendisabal, who is the, the figure here on the bottom right, and uh, finally also those of the um, following the creation of the Italian state 
in 1861. So secularizations um, were, you know, took place for various reasons, but uh, um, to summarize the, um, the phenomenon, uh, it included the, the dissolution of monastic institutions, the appropriation of um, the wealth, part of which, very small part in a sense, um, included libraries. The libraries were uh, generally um, relocated in what became national or municipal libraries or redistributed to other religious ecclesiastical institutions like seminaries uh, or sometimes also simply destroyed. But a lot of that also were put on sale and uh, as you can imagine, in the movement of uh, um, thousands and thousands of books, uh, the um, displacement uh, uh, was massive. And uh, of course, part of it, a large part, ended up on the market. And here I've just put three figures um, which were um, majorly responsible for um, uh, sale uh, and relocations of uh, uh, books from Italian collections uh, around Europe and mostly in the United States, Olschke, Tamro de Marinis, and Martini. Uh, a number of books uh, in, in, uh, in the recent decade have been uh, uh, published uh, looking at uh, the creation of the antiquarian book market and uh, at uh, um, its movement, uh, the growth of interest, why it happened, uh, books like uh, Christian Jensen, Revolution and the Antiquarian Book, or David McKittrick, uh, The Invention of uh, Rare Books, uh, or Readers in a Revolution. International projects uh, uh, like the one called Cultivate Manuscripts, uh, whose PI is Laura Cleaver at the University of London, uh, focus on uh, exactly the trade in rare books and manuscripts between Europe and the United States at a very pivotal, pivotal, pivotal time uh, at the turn of the 19th century and 20th century. But the question remains, what was behind the increased availability of antiquarian books on the market? What enabled the activities of scholars, booksellers, private collectors, and libraries. That is what uh, we discussed uh, um, already oh, 10 years ago at a conference in, uh, over 10 years ago now, a conference in Oxford entitled How the Secularization of Religious Houses Transformed the Library of Europe between the 16th and the 19th century. The volume is finally uh, it was published uh, uh, last year uh, by Brepos. So in it, I was looking at, you know, just to give you an example, at uh, all the different monasteries whose books are today represented in just one library, the Bodleian Library in Oxford. As you can see from this uh, a visualization done by a um, team at King's College uh, uh, in London who worked on uh, uh, the data I had, uh, you can see that uh, 567 monasteries have bits of their collections today at the Bodleian Library. And this is just one library. And of course, among those books, there are books from San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice. It is indeed one of these four books uh, I've been working on when I was cataloging in Funabula of San Giorgio Maggiore that inspired me the question that every scholar, every cataloger have to ask himself or herself. So here is the Bible with the inscription that the book belonged to the monks of the Congregation of Santa Giustina of Padua, assigned to San Giorgio Maggiore, with a shelf mark, 15th century shelf mark number 773. 
So the question is, what are the other books? Uh, this uh, kind of work really was behind what inspired uh, a collaboration with Lavinia Prosdochmi, then uh, librarian at Padua University Library, um, Biblioteca Universitaria, I mean, and Dori Trans, who is a uh, professor at the University of Kaposkari, the history of library. We worked for mm, over 10 years on the reconstruction of the Incunabula collection of San Giorgio. So the sources we can rely on are really multiples from the inscription that you've seen. Uh, they were left uh, on the books uh, at different times over the centuries from the 15th century onward to illumination that scholars like Lillian Armstrong were able to identify specifically commissioned for San Giorgio, like that beautiful uh, um, uh, illuminated S uh, with San Giorgio and the dragon that you see um, on the bottom left, and most importantly, documents, archival documents, which in many cases confirmed and in many other cases gave us new information about books that once belonged to this library and have since either vanished or been destroyed or we are still searching for them and you will hear a bit more later. So in terms of the physical books they you know they emerged uh, because a number of Many uh, libraries were collect were describing their incunabula in material evidence in incunabula database, where we reconstruct the history of each book from the moment it was printed to the time when it enters the library where it is now. To date, um, over uh, sixty four thousand incunabula are described in such manner, and they belong to six hundred seventy. Uh, nine libraries in 30 different countries in four continents. These records have been created by a network of librarians and scholars working together, to date at least 267. And uh, they, you know, in this, uh, by describing them in their history, we capture the, um, you know, former owners, their former owners, and that, that means that we are in the process with this database of reconstructing libraries, mostly dispersed, as you can see, uh, almost uh, uh, to over 27,000 libraries are in the process of being reconstructed simply because we are working together. We are putting the data together. So if we search for San Giorgio uh, in the satellite database, um, where we register all the former owners of NEI, we find that uh, um, so far 181 incunabula are uh, recorded. By clicking on that, you immediately see all of them. In particular, very important, you have a facets on the right by holding institution. So that tells us that this is a dispersed collection where the books are only in part where they were supposed to be. And the books of San Giorgio Maggiore were secularized by Napoleon at the end of the 18th century, and they were supposed to go to Padua. If you look at the list, only 37 books are in Padua today. Why others are in Paris, where the books were taken away to and never returned, or in Venice and the Marciana, where in fact uh, some restitution took place, but then are in many other places around the world, which we could never have guessed where they were, but because the libraries catalogued in NEI, we, you know, the books came to us. So Paris, you know, Padua, Paris still there, the one back in Venice, but as you can see, others are in Sweden, in Denmark, in England, at Harvard, in Israel, and various other, in Vienna and other places in Italy. 
As I mentioned, many of the books uh, actually can be easily recognized by the inscriptions that uh, were left uh, from the 15th century onward. And then at different time of recognition, also uh, corresponding with the creation of the new libraries at San Giorgio, um, new um, uh, ownership marks were um, created, which can all uh, tell us um, the belonging to the collection. Um, in the list of uh, uh, 102 in Cinabula, as you can see, we also list historical copies. Historical copies are uh, copies that books that we know from documents evidence that belong to San Giorgio, but we don't know where they are today. And the evidence we have, as I said, is plentiful and there is uh, uh, various types of documentary evidence. For example, the inspections by the librarian of the Marciana of the Books of San Giorgio in 1789, the list of desiderata prepared by the librarian of the Bibliothèque Nationale of Paris and given to the Napoleonic agents who were coming um, around the, the libraries of Italy, or uh, the list of the Venetian Ciconia of the books sequestered by the French, or the list attached to the dissolution of San Giorgio. Um, and it was created by um, the Viceroy of the Kingdom of Italy. And then we have a list of books moved to Milan, and of course the books moved to Padua. And of course, uh, um, the books that move around from place to place in Padua, and in fi finally the restitution from Paris. So all of these uh, documents were cross-referenced by myself, Dorit, and Lavinia, and allowed us to give a much fuller picture of reconstruction and most important of understanding of the library of San Giorgio Maggiore. Why is this important? This is a question rather blunt that uh, anybody who is uh, um, used to um, justify their research to funding bodies is actually asked. You know, why is it important that we reconstruct an historical library? It is because we, if we only looked at the few books today in Padua, we would have a very misleading impression of the intellectual stature of this institution. Market forces, as I mentioned, determine the displacement often of the most valuable or so perceived when this happened, editions. The one printed by Nicholas Jensen, by John of Cologne, by Vindelinus Aspira, by Aldus Manutius. These are already by the 18th century were perceived as the great printers of the first uh, print revolution. And uh, sure enough, these are the ones not in Padua today. This also happens to be the editions on in non-theological subjects. We can have a very quick, again, overview in the database uh, NEI of authors and subjects. What are they? For example, books of agriculture uh, printed by Jensen. And this one is now in the Bridense National Library of Milan, also beautifully uh, illuminated. Or books of architecture with the usual note, now belongs to San Giorgio. This is Leon Battista Alberti, the Redificatoria, printed in Florence. And where is today? It's in Paris, because it was sequestered and never returned. Or books of geography, like the Geographia of Strabo by Vindelinus de Spira. Again, another copy, still in Paris today. Books of geometry, the beautiful Euclides printed by Ratold in Venice in 82. So this actually went to Padua, but then we lost track. So it was dispersed between 13 and 31, 
and sure enough, must be still out there in some other library, and we will be able to trace it. Oh, then we have books of astronomy, the great Reggio Montanos, printed by Hammans in 96. This is still in Padua uh, today. Books of grammar, Greek grammar, famous uh, uh, lexicon in Greek and Latin, printed in Milan. It, moved, it was taken to Paris, but then entered the market, and it was purchased in 1824 uh, by the Bologna in Oxford, and is in Oxford today. A lot more grammar is still uh, represented in the great collection of San Giorgio, like Tortellius, Tortellius, the Autographia, printed by Jensen again, and now uh, I believe still in Paris. Much more Greek, uh, like uh, Todoro Gazzas, printed by Manuzio, Marcel, Nono Marcello, Perotto, now in Uppsala. Theology um, also, of course, was taken away, like in this case, uh, uh, still in Paris, because, of course, there is the beautiful decoration, uh, as you can see here, the detail, which is uh, referring directly to the commission, probably by the Monastery of San Giorgio itself. And then, of course, we have uh, multiple works of medicine, major works like Avicenna or Mesue. You will know in a short while why all of this is relevant, uh, not just books that somebody might have said they had on the shelves and they didn't read. Very much not the case. Even books of music, the famous treatise of Franchino Gafurius, which again, are very rare today and still in Paris. Multiple works of natural history, Pliny, three different editions of Pliny. Natural history was very important for San Giorgio and its garden. And I'll come back to this uh, shortly. Then, of course, history, law, philosophy, rhetoric, literature. And, of course, the great Dante, the first edition illustrated with drawings um, uh, of Botticelli, uh, the copy is still in Paris today. So, again, why is it important? Another reason is that uh, these books are evidence of early importation of foreign editions into Italy and Venice in particular. Everybody knows that Italy and Venice exported everywhere in Europe in the early years of printing. There is much less evidence on the importation of foreign editions into uh, Italy, and a number of editions in, uh, in, the, the, in the San Giorgio collection, in fact, tell us that books from Germany were imported very quickly. This is the greatest example, is the, probably the first printed book ever purchased by uh, uh, the monks of San Giorgio, is the Razionale Divinorum Officiorum printed in Mainz in 1459, a beautiful, uh, uh, also multicolored uh, edition, with an inscription, as you can see, that it was purchased in 1461. Two years after publication in Mainz, the book was already in Venice, where it was purchased. And it was marked number 315. Keep an eye on this. They also have works printed in Basel. And again, this was printed in Basel in 1485. And we have evidence to believe that this was purchased by the local bookseller uh, Venetian bookseller from the local bookseller Francesco de Madis in uh, uh, probably um, 86 already. Another one is this one uh, printed in Nuremberg, Boetius, again uh, early on in San Giorgio. So why is important? Also because it shows that uh, immediately after the introduction of printing, uh, the monks of San Giorgio, like many others, embraced 
the new technology in vast quantities. So if we look at the inscription of the Durandus purchased in 1461, it was number 315. The Cassiano um, purchased, we think, in 1487, it's number 886. What this means is that in 26 years, 571 books were purchased by San Giorgio, and most likely they were all printed books with the new technology. Why is it important again? Because these books in the library are a reflection of ongoing interests, such as the construction of the new Medici Library, which was completed in 1478, and for which we have seen that they had uh, uh, Leon Battista Alberti among their shelves. And the other thing, that important concern, was the Garden of San Giorgio. And for this, I will now show you uh, beautiful images from the project of Sabrina Minuzzi, who um, uh, worked on uh, Materia Medica in transit. So tracing the circulation of medical knowledge in uh, early modern Italy, but in Venice in particular, with a focus on the garden of San Giorgio Maggiore. So um, they, San Giorgio had a medicinal garden uh, on the island, and you can see uh, this beautiful, um, uh, as you say, print from uh, Matthew Marian of 1635, where some of the gardens beautifully arranged are very clearly marked. So they had, uh, in the 15th century, uh, um, they were growing vegetables, pumpkins, spinach, cabbage, lettuce, and various aromatic herbs. But also, and this is a wonderful, you know, not many actually knew about this, they started planting uh, olive trees. And still in the archive, you can see these maps for the layout of their olive grove. Uh, the olive trees survived in San Giorgio until 1797, when they were uprooted to make room for Croatian troops stationed on the island. And of course, San Giorgio had uh, an apothecary where they manipulated all the herbs and the produce of their uh, medicinal garden. And we have a look at that. Um, so again, this instead is the other view from the famous the Barbary. Um, this is a, a document that shows that with the olive oil, uh, actually the monks produced a very famous balsam, mixed it with certain other herbs, and which became very famous uh, um, around and uh, beyond uh, Venice. And um, this again shows uh, how they were making uh, you know, the other plants that they were including for making the balm. Another thing that Minuzzi has focused their attention is the an inventory of the um, apothecary, the, 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 the spezieria, where they kept all their spices in San Giorgio, uh, and they kept all the ingredients. This inventory also included a list of their books. So books that were kept not in the library, but they were kept in their um, workshop uh, for um, in their apothecary products. Among them are major publications like uh, Mattioli of the edition of 1605, or uh, another Mesue of a much later edition from the Infinabile list that we found, or Dioscorides. And uh, basically, this uh, shows that San Giorgio and in, in their workshop, uh, all the foundational texts uh, of uh, um, medicine and natural history, which, which were necessary for um, the preparation of uh, their uh, products. So 
now the question is, how can we progress in the reconstruction of the library of San Giorgio, or indeed the libraries, as we include also what was there in the apothecary? One way is uh, to continue prodding uh, the libraries of the world and to stimulate uh, uh, better cataloging so we can identify more of the books of San Giorgio that are at the moment only recorded as historical copies. And uh, I've just been awarding a, a large research grant uh, to work on the incunabula collection of uh, American libraries. And uh, we will work on large and small like libraries all around the United States. And I'm fairly confident that more will emerge from this systematic uh, uh, survey and collaboration with our colleagues. The other way is, of course, to work more on the manuscript collection of San Giorgio. Um, 100 and uh, around almost 70, I think, manuscripts uh, um, of these collections are still in Padua today. And here you can see, thanks to uh, the, the initial survey that uh, Lavinia Prozdocini has done for us, the different shelf marks uh, and inscriptions. But as you can see, you know, we will not, not understand the full reorganization organization of the Library of San Giorgio until we put all these shelf marks together, as it is clear that manuscripts and printed books were together. But the evidence is there, and this can be done. But of course, that's Padua. So where are the others? Uh, I've just started to look at some sources like the Schoenberg database or Digital Scriptorium in the United States. And uh, something emerged at the Lilly, Lilly Library in Indiana, a leaf at the Getty Museum, and maybe other works at Wesley and maybe the British Library. But all this work still needs to be um, you know, done more systematically. In conclusion, uh, may I just say that there is a perfect cocktail for uh, the recreation and reconstruction of libraries. One third is research-based cataloging, one third is good technology, and one third is collaboration. It's very simple, but very effective. Our heritage is shared. And we need every shard of this evidence to understand it, to make sense of it. And, and why? Because we need to build strong cases for its relevance today and in the future. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Christina. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, oh, uh, as a we talk at, at the beginning, maybe we can uh, um, receive your questions if you, if you want, and then we can pass uh, uh, at the end uh, after uh, the second presentation of today. And so, Christina, uh, thank you, thank you again, and thanks to me for the rest of the conference to ask to to answer to the question. So now the floor is uh, for Carolina Gris. Thank you, Carolina, for being here and for, pre Thank you. for the presentation of your MEFA project. The floor is yours. I'm going to share my screen now. Is, can you all see it? Is it OK? Yes. OK, great. So. Um, the Middle East Falconry Archive is a project on which Startu uh, Factum started working in 2021. And it's a project that is funded um, and was started by uh, the International Fund for Obara Conservation in Abu Dhabi. The purpose of this digital archive is to gather all the most important Arabic manuscripts uh, from the medieval period about falconry under um, one digital platform. And um, as you will see from this presentation, 
the purpose is not just to give access to the text these manuscripts contain, but also to these manuscripts as physical objects. So through digital tools, uh, we aim to give access to people to these objects and to almost uh, digitally handle them. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the work that Factum Foundation uh, normally does, this project is a bit different. So Factum normally carries out the digitization of objects um, with special scanner, scanners uh, and different techniques in order to um, obtain the most accurate digital documentation of an object in its current state of preservation. Of course, like the objects are very mm, different. Um, so they could be a book or a painting um, or even um, uh, a building. So in this case, um, I'm saying this is a bit different from the projects we normally do because um, we didn't actually digitize all these manuscripts. So um, a big part of the project was um, carried out while COVID restrictions were still in place. And so we tried to reduce recording trips as much as we could. And instead, we tried to get the libraries to send us images of the uh, manuscripts we wanted to publish on the archive. And in most cases, that worked well. Uh, all the libraries were able to send us images, both uh, libraries in Europe and in the US, but also in other more remote uh, parts of the world. And um, so today I'm going to take you through the steps that it took to assemble this archive that you can now view online. Um, we have 56 manuscripts online and I will show you the link to the website later. Mm. So just to give you an idea of the type of work uh, we did for, for this project, uh, we started from um, the very um, basic um, role of uh, finding contact information of all the libraries that uh, hold the manuscripts. So uh, once we had the contact uh, um, information of the library, we then approached them and requested if they wanted to collaborate with us. And uh, in most cases, they did agree to collaborate. And in that case, we asked them if they could send us images of the manuscripts. Normally, we asked for uh, ideally 600 DPI uh, resolution in pictures, but sometimes we got lower resolution. Uh, the minimum is normally 300 DPI, but we tried to work with what the institution sent us. And then once we got the images, we also um, had to request permissions to uh, reproduce the um, digital manuscripts on the website. So in this project, as in all uh, other projects that Factum carries out, our policy is always that um, the copyrights of the digital data remain entirely to uh, the manuscripts holder. So we did the same in this case, and we published the manuscripts on the website, uh, mostly under a um, Creative Commons license. Uh, mostly non-commercial. And even in the cases when a library in our list had already published their manuscript on their digital platform, we and the manuscript was in the public domain, we still asked the library uh, if they were okay with us to publish. So this is normally how we, how we work. And then uh, with the images, we um, process them and uh, publish them on the digital flat platform with the, uh, their set of metadata. Um, in addition to that, Factum also provided consulting and strategy throughout the project. Um, we did so for the most um, basic things such as which protocols to adopt to uh, contact institutions, thanks to our expertise uh, in the field of um, cultural heritage and preservation. And then we also advised the fund on which were the best um, digital archiving systems to be used for this um, type of archive. Um, and then we also worked on um, advice for broader issues such as the issue of the storage um, of data in the long term, which is something that Factum is constantly ex experimenting with and is very interested in. And then as the project went by, um, 
we were asked by the client to also find ways in which we could expand this digital archive after the first phase of the project, which ended in June 2023. So um, our idea is to expand this archive by including uh, other types of artic artifacts, not just manuscripts, but also um, statues or um, paintings, frescoes, anything that tells us something about the um, heritage of the practice of falconry. And we, in the second phase that we are now working on, we are also going to produce a number of other things such as translations of the texts, um, but also um, publications. And we are going to work a lot on collaborations with institutions and um, uh, organize the symposiums and things like this. Um, because we think it's very important to communicate all the work that has been done in the first phase of the project. So, talking in very practical terms, um, we started working with a bibliography. So the bibliography for uh, this digital archive was created by um, Dr. Anna Kazoy, uh, who is a professor at the Graduate Center at CUNY. And the bibliography is a research bibliography that was always intended to be expanded and amended throughout the project. So initially, the bibliography listed a bit more than 70 manuscripts. But um, among these manuscripts, some presented information uh, to do with their cataloging number or location that had not yet been verified. Just to give you an idea of how difficult this project was at times, we didn't even have the name of the library or we didn't even have uh, uh, the city specified. But anyway, so the, the most challenging part of this project, uh, but also rewarding in some ways, was to um, check whether the manuscripts in the bibliography were actually located in the institutions uh, that were listed there. And then once we uh, checked that, we had also to confirm that the catalog and shelf members corresponded to the title listed in the bibliography. Um, so this required a lot of work and, uh, um, of course, uh, some of the libraries were uh, our libraries in Europe and in North America that were easily accessible, most of them, but other libraries were very difficult to reach, especially because sometimes they didn't have a website or the website was not updated, uh, so we couldn't find we couldn't even find an email address. So in, um, in some cases, we had to try um, several times to contact them uh, by telephone, by uh, snail mail. And uh, from June 2021 to June 2023, we secured collaborations with 21 institutions across the world from North America to the Middle East. Um, and so, um, we obtained images from them and published, as I said earlier, 56 manuscripts on the archive, which you can now view. And uh, um, each manuscript is published with a set of metadata, but also with um, technical notes that tell you details about what is contained in that manuscript. Uh, and then summary notes for uh, maybe like people who are enthusiastic about this, but are not necessarily scholars who are interested in the more uh, um, the more detailed parts of the text. So um, once we received the images, the next step was uh, to process them. Teresa Casado in the photography department at Factum took care of the editing of all the images. And um, she also, um, this was a long and tedious work because uh, not only did she have to um, edit the, the color, the saturation, crop them, but she also had to rename each file individually uh, before publishing them on the platform. And then, and then once she did that, she published them with the metadata. So for the visualiz visualization of the data, we chose um, content DM by OCLC as the uh, digital archive uh, uh, software. And we chose this um, software um, for many reasons, but mainly because we knew it could be configured with a, a IIIF viewer. 
as many of you know here, I'm sure, um, triple, um, abiding by the IIIF protocol is essential when we talk about digital libraries. And now I'm going to show you, well, this archive was configured to be used with uh, uh, one IIIF viewer called Mirador, and I'm going to show you how it works. In this is the website for those of you who want to look at it. So when you open the website, this is what comes up and then you visit the digital archive, browse, and here you have a list of all the manuscripts. When you click on one of them, the Content DM page opens. Content DM, as I was saying, is great because it can be configured with uh, a IIIF viewer, but it also supports a number of other softwares. And um, it's also a very useful platform because it's integrated with WorldCat, so that makes the archive uh, very accessible. Uh, to the wider public. And also something that is interesting for Factum, again, those of you who know our work mm, might know that we um, scan a lot of objects in 3D. So uh, the fact that Sketchfab can be embedded means that we could visualize 3D uh, digital objects on the archive in the future. And this will be um, really interesting. Also when, not just for objects like statues, but also with books, um, having the three-dimensional uh, features of um, a book binding, for example, is uh, quite interesting. So this is the content DM page when you open it. Here you see the manuscript, and then below it is the metadata of the manuscript. In the object description, there are these items that were um, um, agreed by uh, Dr. Akazoi and Factum and the client. So this took quite a long time just, just to choose uh, which items we would include here. And you can see from this that digitizing a manuscript to include it in a digital archive doesn't only mean making it accessible, but it also means adding so much to the object itself. So here, all this information is open to everyone and it, it's extremely helpful and I encourage you to look at the website because it contains really so much. And you can also, uh, for every manuscript, you can also click on a link to open this PDF, which contains what I mentioned earlier, more technical information regarding each manuscript. These are um, charts that are quite long, a few pages long, and um, they are an extremely useful uh, resource. And then going back to the content DM page, so if you click next to the printing icon, you have these three little bars. This opens the Mirador viewer, which looks like this. Mm, Mirador, I'm sure some of you will know how it works, but it's an open source viewing platform that is really user friendly. And um, you can look at the manuscript like this. The metadata comes in a canvas like here. And then you can decide to view the manuscript in, in full screen, and you can choose different um, layouts to view the manuscript. So here is an example of how you can uh, zoom and pan with the arrows in the bottom right. And here you can decide to view the manuscript as a book or like here in a kind of mosaic. But most importantly, um, Having triple IF is essential because with this system, you can compare a manuscript from this archive with another manuscript from any other digital collection that uses the triple IF protocol. So you can also compare it not only with manuscripts, with any objects really that are uploaded to a digital platform that uses triple IF. So in this case here, I uploaded two manuscripts from EFA. So the way to do it is very easy. You just um, copy the IIIF manifest link and paste it in the URL box there and load. You can load several objects here and then you can look at them in comparison um, here. So yeah, this is really how the Web, uh, the website of the Digital Archive works. And for those of you who are interested in this topic, uh, and for those of you who wonder 
why it's important to gather these manuscripts uh, all under the same roof. You can also look at the manuscript summaries um, that are also in the website. These are quite uh, interesting. These tell quite interesting stories of what is contained in these uh, books. And now, um, finally, I just wanted to bring a few examples of um, to show you why this project was so challenging, but also uh, so satisfying. Um, and I thought of doing so by showing you some discoveries of manuscripts that we made throughout the project. Of course, all these discoveries were supported um, almost entirely by Dr. Akazoi's research, uh, which together with our um, investigations led to some quite interesting places. So um, the discoveries I'm talking about are of two types. Some of them are discoveries of texts contained in manuscripts that we were not expecting, even manuscripts that uh, are um, stored in libraries in Europe that are quite widely accessible. And some other discoveries are to do with uh, institutions that were a bit harder to reach and that sometimes held manuscripts that we did not know uh, existed. And I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are um, from this field and know that a lot of bibliographies are based on catalogs that are printed catalogs, and some of them are very old. So often, um, the information um, that we get in a bibliography has not been updated for several hundred years. And so here, this is the first example. Um, this is a manuscript from the library in Lund and it had not digitized before we requested it. So um, it's quite interesting to see that even libraries in Europe have not yet started to digitize their collections. Uh, and so with projects like this, you encourage them to do it, um, and it's great. So this manuscript uh, is really important because it contains a text that before, um, before Anna Kazoi found this manuscript was only transmitted to us through extensive quotations in other books. And Anna Kazoi found that actually this manuscript contains the only known complete preserved Arabic copy of this text, which is a manual on hunting animals. And apparently this was a handbook that was very um, popular in the Mediterranean world in the 13th century. And for a decade, scholars had been looking for a complete copy. And now they have it available here in this archive with, of course, all the research attached to it that Anna Akazoi um, produced. And then the second example I wanted to bring is um, a manuscript from the Al Karawin Library in Fez. Um, this picture speaks to us about the urgency of digitizing um, these manuscripts because this has, this book has been completely eaten by bookworms, uh, which didn't really like the taste of ink, luckily. So the text is still preserved, but the object is really fragile and it might disappear uh, at some point. So, um, but this manuscript is interesting because um, it's located in a library that we managed to uh, get in touch with after many, many attempts through local cultural institutions uh, in Morocco. Uh, but even once we got in touch with the librarian, it was very difficult for us to um, understand if the manuscript we were looking for, so the manuscript listed in the bibliography we had, actually matched the manuscript that the librarian found for us. And so um, Larissa Van Morsel from Factum was in Fez and she took the occasion to visit the library and talk to the librarian di directly to see if she could get somewhere. And so from this visit, she found that this manuscript did not correspond to that in the bibliography, but it also contains uh, a book that is um, very important of, uh, for falconry literature. And what she found, and this is, um, something that is interesting for us is that the library actually holds other manuscripts that contain texts on falconry that have not yet been cataloged. 
And so uh, I think the librarian mentioned another two or three manuscripts that we might be interested in, and we are trying, we're gonna try to develop this in a second phase of the project. And then here, these are the bookworms. And then here, this third example is quite interesting. And I think it's uh, very much related to what Christina Donley was talking about uh, before me. So this book was listed in the bibliography as belonging to a library in Tunis called Maktaba al -Amadiyya. And so we were looking for an address and we're not going anywhere because we couldn't find anything, uh, any information regarding the library. And then uh, at one point, we managed to get in touch with the uh, National Library in Tunisia. And the librarian was very, very helpful. And we asked um, if she could send us images of two other manuscripts that um, were in the bibliography. And because she was so helpful, we asked her if she had any information about this library, Maktaba al -Amadiyya. And she told us that the library had actually been dismantled and part of its collection had been relocated to the National Library. And so we were lucky because one of the two manuscripts we were looking for had actually been relocated there. Uh, but the other one that we were looking for, we still have no clue about um, where it is. Um, but this is a great example that shows you how when you are um, making an object accessible and finding it and digitizing it, you are also adding um, a little brick to its transmission history. And yes, and then finally, I mean, I'm sure you will find uh, loads of things on the website, but I wanted to just show you three manuscripts that I think are quite extraordinary and we have them here in the archive. Um, the first of them is a preview of something that has not yet been published on the archive. And it's a manuscript that we obtained. Um, it took us a long time to get in touch with this library in Ankara in Turkey. And uh, when we received the images, Anna Kazoy got really excited because she said that this um, manuscript contains the older version, the oldest version of the book of Adam and Algitrif that we have in the MEFA digital archive. So this is a book that is one of was one of the most popular books on falconry that talks about um, training birds and curing their illnesses. And Anna Kazoy thinks that this manuscript is even older than the Leiden manuscript, which is also on the archive um, that we thought would be like the oldest that we had. But actually now we have this and it's hopefully gonna go online soon. So you're soon gonna be able to view it in full. And then this other example from Madrid. Um, I don't know if you know that Madrid um, is also where the headquarters of Factum are. And so you would have thought that getting in touch with the library there would have been easy. But actually, it was very difficult to get access to this manuscript, uh, manuscript there in 1947. Uh, this is a manuscript that contains um, the only known surviving copy of a very rare collection of um, personal recollection from a 12th century person. And uh, he wrote extensively about falconry. And um, this manuscript was, uh, it is like in the Biblioteca del Escorial, but um, uh, Patrimonio Nacional is currently digitizing their collection to upload it on their own digital platform. And so they're doing, they're doing it section by section. Um, but because we, are, we were building this archive and we were really excited to publish it, then they, um, we managed to like push them a bit and they sped up the digitization process and the manuscript is now online. And initially when we started conversation with them, it would have taken probably like another year or two. So mm, that's now online. And finally, the last example is this manuscript from Dublin, which is a very rare manuscript because it contains the only known surviving author's original copy uh, of the oldest manuscript containing Arabic falconry literature. Uh, so here it is. Of course, Dublin, um, this library in Dublin is accessible to us who live in Europe, but uh, the manuscript had not yet been digitized and now it is online. Um, 
So um, just to close my part of this lecture, um, I hope that I've shown you what it takes to put together a digital archive like this one. And also that when you're digitizing objects to make them accessible, you are actually actively researching their history as well. And you are without really like knowing that you're going to, you're also making discoveries of new objects that you didn't know existed. And please let me know if you have any questions, I'd be happy to um, answer them after this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina. So beautiful presentation. And uh, it seems to me that also in this project, the receipt that Christina has just revealed to us has been applied uh, one third research, one third technology, and uh, one third um, collaboration. So, yes, it's true, it's the right receipt. Um, I don't know if Adam is uh, still with us and uh, if uh, uh, he wants to uh, come and uh, share with us his remarks. Uh, um, uh, after these two presentations. And then we can um, pass uh, the questions that can appear uh, on the chat. Thank you. Elenia, thank you very much. So <laughs> Christina and Carolina, uh, thank you for those two presentations. Um, for me, uh, when Factum first started working with the Fondazione Giorgio Cini back in 2006, when we were asked to record um, Veronese's wedding at Cana and, and produce a facsimile, uh, which uh, was installed in the refectory uh, on the island, the Palladium refectory in 2007. I never dreamt that the kind of uh, momentum that that project started would lead to a conversation like this. So the Veronese was removed uh, by or on the instructions of um, uh, Napoleon's forces. It was forcibly ripped off the wall uh, and shipped to Paris, uh, where it's uh, been a, uh, the largest painting in the, the Louvre uh, since the Louvre opened. Um, I didn't know at that time anything about the story uh, of the Benedictine Library, uh, but the beautiful thing is, is once people started focusing on what digital technologies could do, how they could change the relationship uh, between an original or object and uh, the authenticity of that object and the things we can understand from that object and the kinds of different forms of access we can have to that object, uh, that a whole um, a process uh, was, was put into place um, in between uh, the talks today and the installation of the the wedding at Kenna. There have been many other shows, Rethinking Piranesi, when Factum and the Chini worked together, or the extraordinary exhibition Mindful Hands about the collection of pages cut from medieval manuscripts uh, that um, allowed access to the... Um, uh, mindset before Raphael, so extraordinary images which were in perfect, unrestored condition that suddenly appeared. Um, and I I think the, the launch of Archive um, uh, has given us a real chance to look at how technology uh, can play a role in bringing different types of information into the public domain in very different ways. And I think a big part of the conversation that goes on in all the projects we work on is who has access to these things? Who can gain from access to them? Who's being excluded from them? So I I always remember um, when I was at um, the Ruskin uh, in Oxford um, and not really being taught how to use a library going to the Bodleian and trying to find something was always a very daunting experience. So I think a big part of what has happened with the Middle East Falconry Archive, for example, is that now all these um, manuscripts are together in one place. 
they can be seen on one platform. And I think interlibrary sharing uh, through the IIIF protocols has really opened the doors for new ways and for new audiences to um, have access to very specialist subjects. And this is certainly something at Archive that we want to push in the next three uh, to five years. So we've been very fortunate um, that the Helen Hamlin Trust has provided the uh, finance to develop the technologies we've been developing to focus on recording the archive of the Chini uh, Foundation, but also uh, other archives. So the team is growing. Uh, the amount of work that's being done um, uh, is extraordinary when um, uh, you look at the number of um, images from the Phototeca that have been recorded uh, and increasingly being made uh, are being made available in in more and more iconophilic ways, so ways where you don't need to have um, a deep knowledge uh, of the um, uh, library systems to find the objects you're you're trying to source. Um, we're also profoundly grateful um, to the um, International Fund for Hubara Conservation, uh, who commissioned Factum uh, to do the work that Christina has been talking about. So I think it's these kind of enlightened uh, uh, uses of new technology uh, with a platform that has global access that's really bringing the data to new audiences. And I think this is the thing we're most proud of. I mean, at Factum, we're not only focusing on recording, as, as Carolina said, but we're also focused on developing the recording technologies. Uh, at Archive, the first system we developed uh, was a, a rotary table system uh, for recording double-sided documents at high speed um, and uh, downloading them with initial metadata tags that could then be built upon. Um, in the past uh, five years, we focused on a photometric stereo system for treating books as physical objects not just as a digitization of the images or the text that are on the page, but the material digitization of the, the pages themselves and the bindings. And um, Archive is now working closely with uh, a sister uh, entity called Archeox, which is based in Oxford, where John Barrett, um, who's one of the leading imaging technicians specialists uh, at the Bodleian, has been using the Selen scanner, the photometric stereo system, uh, for the recording uh, of a diverse series of objects. And I'd recommend everyone here to look at the Archeox website because um, what's happening there is a, a whole cascade of discoveries. Um, and discoveries are something that one always thinks of as being very rare. But actually, when you look at things differently, when you bring them together in different ways. You throw up a kind of information that allows different perceptions to come to the fore. And at Oxford, that's happened on an almost uh, weekly basis. Um, and there'll be some very big discoveries to be announced soon. Uh, but there's been a lot of interest over the last year uh, on research into the Goff map uh, and on um, uh, the uh, recordings by uh, Joe's so story of some insular manuscripts where the surface recording at 22 microns, 24 microns, is revealing indentations and marginal notation that have never been observed before. And I think it's this thing, I mean, so the, the manuscript that Carolina talked about um, in Lund uh, is almost like one of those things that when I remember getting that email from Carolina, um, feeling just incredibly excited. So how could one uh, redefine or redescribe an object that had been catalogued a hundred years ago? And um, I think listening to, uh, to Christina talking um, and really the subject of this presentation is all about um, the future of libraries, um, but really the future is being refound in their past. And uh, Christina and I have had some really interesting conversations about 
the um, organizational structure of the library, uh, the Benedictine library, in its pre-Palladian uh, format. So how, what sort of building was it in? How was it presented? Who had access to it? Um, what was the content it held? And I think increasingly, as these questions are being focused on, uh, answers are starting to percolate up. And so I hope that over the next two or three years, uh, we'll be able to develop um, an online presence uh, for uh, the Benedictine uh, Library at San Giorgio uh, that will really uh, give new insights into what happened on the island of San Giorgio Maggiore um, many, many years ago. So um, I'm very grateful to both speakers today, and I hope all everyone listening can feel the excitement that's happening both in Venice and in Oxford um, as digital technologies are starting to find increasingly innovative forms for both online and physical sharing uh, of objects. So with that, um, I would welcome any questions uh, from uh, anyone listening now um, and would love in a way to start um, uh, by um, asking uh, Christina, Christina, how much do we know about the shelving systems and the cataloging systems and the library system that was used by the early Benedictine monks as they were assembling their library? And um, in a way, how, how do you think they saw their role? Um, were they looking to the future? or were they living in the present, trying to gather information that helped their own understanding? Oh, thank you, Adam. Thank you for all the uh, intelligent and interconnected considerations that you have done. I, uh, it's been wonderful to present um, um, the work that I've been doing with Dorita and Lavinia next to Carolina, because um, we are in a way complementary projects with very um, similar methodological uh, strengths. And, uh, and that it really shows that you can have uh, different uh, uh, historical objectives, uh, but the way to go about it, <laughs> it's pretty, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, there are some certain steps that are the same and certain qualities of, um, of means that are the same. So uh, you've seen uh, from the images that I've shown that there are a lot of shelf maps. And, uh, um, and it became clear when we tried to put together only the incunabula shelf marks, of which we had uh, oh, dozens, uh, that we were going nowhere. We could not understand the order. But that's why we need to continue and integrate uh, those numbers with the one um, left uh, onto the manuscripts and uh, we haven't done that yet it's something that is uh, you know the, the the task for the months ahead and uh, i think we will uh, um, understand eventually you know by doing the work the we have the evidence and uh, uh, we'll be able to see what was going on how they were um, how they were arranging them and what kind of intellectual thinking uh, was behind. But uh, yeah, for me, one of the most satisfying thing is really to see how it was not just a library for buying books and putting them together, but to connect those books to the interest, not only intellectual, but also practical and technical of this community who was uh, uh, building and renovating itself, for example, in the libraries and attending uh, uh, what was uh, uh, clearly a wonderful uh, and working uh, uh, botanical garden that they had. And um, so in a sense, this is a wonderful experiment in working on a community and understanding how the books were functional to the operating uh, uh, life of that community. Um, Benedictines, as you know, they value tradition, 
but uh, as this it shows and the hundreds of Benedictine uh, uh, libraries that we are reconstructing with NEI shows, they certainly look forward. They embrace technology. They, um, but then also uh, sometimes they, they swapped with other communities. So it was a, it's a great network uh, that continues on. And uh, it will be very interesting to see um, also for the following for the, the for the modern period where you know how that develops and uh, to probably find out a bit more about the library of the spezieria that is very interesting that there was a separate library you know how sometimes monastic institutions have uh, liturgical books uh, not in the library but in the church and uh, that is exactly another set of books for another function of their uh, congregation so I think uh, more will come out. Uh, this has been a very good start. And uh, I, I would just like to say, listening to Carolina's uh, presentation, how good cataloging is making all the difference. It's not just ordinary cataloging, because ordinary cataloging doesn't delve into the barely read inscription, you know, ignores that, or identifies a certain illumination or whatever. Good cataloging enables research, and that is what is uh, absolutely foundational in uh, um, our project on San Giorgio as on Carolina for Falconry. The second thing I would like to say, uh, listening again to Carolina, is the same remote work that um, you have been doing by contacting, co contacting the institutions and uh, and uh, receiving images or so digitization remotely. That is exactly the methodology that Printed Revolution in the US will pursue. Because also during the pandemic, we did a project in CERL, uh, the copy census of all the surviving copies of Dante, uh, 1481 edition, uh, funded by the Polonsky Foundation. We wrote, to 135 libraries around the world, everybody replied. If they couldn't send us the information, because you know why in Belarus they, you know, they could not read an inscription of the 15th century, they send us the picture. We did the research, and in that way we enhanced uh, books in the collections uh, and make meaningful for them that what they had because it connected with many other collections around the world. And this is, uh, you know, so it's the same that I've seen you have been doing with Falconry. It is another foundational way of uh, doing, uh, working on these projects. Um, I, may I ask you, uh, sorry, uh, in fact, uh, just um, Carolina, you told us about this effort to search for the name and the location of libraries. And uh, you remind me of a similar work recently done by Martin Eklesek and myself for uh, uh, um, another part of the project uh, on Dante edition uh, 1491. But um, if I uh, understand correctly, uh, you also found a, a previously lost uh, library, it's true, uh, now in Tunisia, perhaps. Yeah, um, it's a library yeah. that was dismantled. Yeah, that no longer exists. And I want, uh, I was wondering if you had uh, found any other similar cases or cases where manuscripts bear the trace of uh, some passage and movement, for example, from town to town. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, um, there are two other cases that are still open in the sense that we have not solved them yet. Um, one of them is a library in Iran, in Zanjian. So we were trying to find an address for this library for ages until we got in touch with the parliament library in Tehran. And the, the librarian working there is very helpful. And when I asked him about this library, he said that similarly to the Tunis mm, small library, this library in Zanjian was a private library uh, of this person. And when he died, part of it 
was um, relocated to the um, um, Tehran Parliament Library, and part of it was um, given to other private collectors. And unfortunately, in that case, the manuscript we were looking for was not in the Parliament Library. So we would have to, we will have to keep investigating, probably like get in touch with um, the uh, family of this person who previously owned the manuscript. Um, so this is one case. And then we have another case in Alexandria. So one of the manuscripts was listed as belonging to um, a small library in Alexandria. And uh, uh, our colleague, uh, Osama Dawad, also visited the library in person. And after loads of phone conversations, in-person conversations, uh, he found that actually that manuscript was no longer in, that, in this um, small council library. Um, and they thought it had been relocated to the Biblioteca Alexandrina, so like the biggest library in Alexandria. But actually, even there, they couldn't find it anywhere. So there is a big mystery um, there. And we have mysteries around other manuscripts as well. It's not um, an easy job, but we are going to keep trying. So it's clear that it's uh, quite important and it's a fortune for uh, everybody I have friends that uh, travel for us, for other libraries in the world, and to check for us uh, uh, the single copies. Yeah, and also our friends who speak many languages so that yeah. they can help us read um, addresses and things like that. Um, it's a huge teamwork. Are there any questions from the floor? So, I mean, uh, one of the things I'd, I'd like to add, um, but I, I really hope some of the, the audience feel free to ask questions, but um, uh, Carolina has just completed uh, the first um, phase uh, of the Middle East Falconry Archive work. And now, um, we've been commissioned to do the second phase. And for me, in a way, the second phase is incredibly exciting. So the first phase was to get all of the medieval Arabic manuscripts we could locate and identify um, uh, uh, into the public domain in one place. Uh, the second phase is both to look to the east uh, and uh, west uh, of the Arab world to uh, look at the spread of influence of those manuscripts um, and how they shaped our understanding of the relationship uh, between uh, uh, mankind and, and the bird, in this case, and the falcon. And uh, I'm very excited about what's going to follow because it's going to lead to uh, more in-depth descriptions which will be added to the archive as we go along. Um, but I hope it's going to lead to new academic research. And at the moment, uh, we're talking with the Warburg Institute about doing a whole series um, of discussions about uh, the influence of um, Arabic uh, manuscripts on the development and understanding of falconry. I think, Eleni, I think there's a question now. I can't see the chat. Yeah, track. I saw the question and I wanted to um, reply to whoever um, asked me this question, if they could send me an email to my email address, because then I will be able to provide um, bibliographical uh, information. Um, sorry, I cannot answer this question like this, but I'd be very grateful if you wanted to write to me about this. So, Ella uh, is a student of mine in Rome. Uh, okay, Harry, great. Harry, no, it's just, it's better to do it by email because then I can write everything say down. That I've seen that at least a, a couple of my students from Rome uh, are attending uh, the work, so yeah. I'm delighted. Thank you so much for the question, by the way. And as like with Christina's project in this project, um, we welcome help from everyone because we need it. So. And uh, for you, Christina, uh, you list uh, um, um, uh, examples from the inventories and uh, for the books that you uh, are sure that were in the library. And you are talking about uh, a printed book, but also manuscripts. 
I imagine. So uh, not only printed book, but also manuscript. And I asked you if you found some other type of uh, list of uh, uh, documents in this inventory that you already uh, studied. I mean, uh, documentary in documents um, that can give us information um, about uh, uh, the ways that the monks uh, uh, received the books or bought the books. So the, the, the person who worked more on this documentary evidence is Dorit, uh, okay. but I've seen them. And uh, what happens is that uh, often the lists are very carefully done and divide the incunabula from the manuscripts from the later um, uh, printed books. So, of course, for this for the initial project, we focused only on the incunabula. But of course, yes, there is all the rest. Uh, these books, uh, these lists are uh, varied. And um, uh, you, um, uh, I think uh, in uh, both, uh, yes, the, I think the early footnotes on the article uh, that Dorit Lavin and I wrote uh, include information found in the archives where booksellers are mentioned, so purchases and acquisitions um, also later in the 16th and 17th century. So, of course, yes, there is so much more uh, to, to that can be done to detailed uh, their continuous acquisition of um, of books. And um, I think that is something that also Sabrina Minuzzi has encountered in the set of um, documents uh, listed after San Giorgio Maggiore in the Archivio di Stato. Luckily, yes, th there is that. So it just needs to be done. <laughs> Elenia, there's a question that's come in about uh, manuscripts um, that are in private collections, especially collections in churches, monasteries, and mosques, and um, uh, madrasas, and with the Islamic scholars. Um, I, I mean, obviously, we hope uh, that as the research becomes better known, and as the work that Carolina and the team on the Middle East Falconry Archive are doing, that people will become aware of it and, and new uh, manuscripts that may not have been catalogued or may not have been known previously uh, will come to light. Um, I suppose I'd like to um, make one comment about this, which is when we were working um, in uh, Dagestan uh, to digitize the National Archive in Maheshkala, um, they have about uh, 300, sorry, 3000 uh, manuscripts uh, in uh, Arabic dating from the 9th to the 19th, 20th century. Um, and we we set up a project uh, to digitize all of those. Um, very sadly, uh, COVID and, and now uh, the war in Ukraine uh, has meant that we no longer have access to the digitization uh, of that was carried out. Um, but the really exciting part was through an artist called Rashid Qureshi, um, uh, I met the Mufti of Debent, um, and he asked us to work uh, after the recording in the State Archive in Makashkala to work on the recording of the many, many uh, manuscripts that were in the hands of the mosques and madrasas and the Islamic scholars in Dagestan. Um, and that was going to be the second phase of the project. Um, no one really knows the number, but while 3,000 uh, survived um, the Stalin destructions of, of um, religious manuscripts there. Um, there were likely to be in the region of 25 to 30,000 manuscripts from the same period um, in private hands. So these are much more likely never to have been uh, digitized and only to be known by the people who actually use them locally. So I think one of the key things that's happening is as the technologies allow us uh, to um, uh, have access to specialist libraries and make them public, more and more things are coming forward. And I think this is where a vast number of, of discoveries and, and new information will come to light. Uh, and so Adam, that is the second uh, 
but the same uh, um, the same audience I ask if uh, we you have uh, any collaboration with uh, uh, HMML and I didn't know these acronyms uh, what correspond maybe you know I I I don't so HMML I know uh, we, uh, you okay. do. It's the Hill Monastic uh, Library, Hill Museum and Monastic Library in Minnesota, Himmel. Okay. They do a lot of digitization work uh, in uh, Africa and the Middle East, uh, in um, uh, in the places at risk. They started with with um, microfilming twenty plus years ago. So it's a Father Columba Stewart operation. So, so I think the answer is to date we haven't had any contact, but we would welcome it. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, we have in our bibliography, we have some manuscripts that belong to collections in private or like small religious schools and mosques, but they have been, well, we haven't found um, contact information for, for those institutions yet, but we hope we can do so in the future. So, yeah. I'm going to definitely check out this HMML. So please, if you could send any information as well, um, we'd, we would love to talk to HMML. Perfect, yeah. Um, there are very inspiring videos uh, about their work uh, and interviews to Father Columba Stewart, who is uh, a Benedictine and really embodies, as he himself said in his inspiring lectures, the spirit of uh, the Benedictine, of embracing and preserving uh, knowledge also for the future. Well, thanks to Martina to provide the link on the chat for the hmmm.org. Any other questions? I think yeah, you are also HMML is a Benedictine institution, so a sort of crossing today, a crossing of information, very interesting, yes. Very much so. Very much. And may I just say, as um, there is the space, that um, the images I showed about the gardens of San Giorgio Maggiore are part of uh, a set of uh, nine short videos that Sabrina Minuzzi has prepared for her Marie Curie on Materia Medica, and they will uh, soon be available on the project website. Uh, on the um, University Kafoskari um, server. Okay, so thank you everybody uh, for being with us this afternoon. And if there are no more questions, uh, I think we can uh, just see each other on the next hour. Uh, program uh, just to, to be update uh, follow us on Instagram and on our website. Thank you very much. It has been great. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, Carolina, and Adam. Thank you very much. Yes, I remember to check the website because uh, the program of the uh, archive online academy for the next month so will be updated um, continuously. So if for, for uh, everybody everybody can be interested also in the other topic that uh, we are um, developing the, during the next month. And I'm very happy to say hello to everybody. Uh, today we were a lot of people, participants, and I'm very happy uh, to start in this way for this new year of uh, educational program for the archive in here in Berlin. So I can say hello to everybody and uh, thanks for being here. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
അതെ